Now, the next man, and we know that this is not about science. They're not doing this for scientific reasons or for climate change. It's all about control. And we do have an expert here with us today, a climate change expert, who's made a mathematical model of climate change over the last 50 years. Now, this man is absolutely amazing, and he will tell you what the real science is and why this is so unnecessary. Please give a massive round of applause to Paul Burgess. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have a website, and I have a channel on YouTube called Climate Realism by Paul Burgess. I don't make a cent from it. In fact, it costs me money, right? Okay. Okay, I'm going to have to shout a bit. Is that better? Right. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called Climate Realism by Paul Burgess. That is a not, I don't make a cent out of it. In fact, I subsidize it all. And that is where you can go and get the real detail behind what I'm going to say today. But what I'm going to say is this. Uh, and I've been involved in this. I'm 78 now. And by qualification, it's my grandkids for doing this. I make lots of videos. Expo I make lots of videos exposing the false science. And the most fundamental thing I want you to take away is this carbon footprint nonsense. Carbon is actually good. More carbon, more CO2 is actually good. You know. And today. All these conferences, all these COP meetings make no difference at all. If you plot the growth of carbon by the graph that everybody agrees on, there is no change when you have a COP meeting. All these trillion dollars spent on it achieve nothing. Today, we are burning more, producing more CO2 than ever before. So why are all these politicians pretending that we're reducing carbon? We're not. But I want to see more of it. Now I'm going to give you an example of some science. 32 scientists in 12 countries with 24 institutions involved. They, they made a study of NASA data, satellite data of the Earth. And they did it over 30 years. And vegetation on Earth grew by 14%. That's the same as two USA land masses going from nothing on them to full of vegetation. And they said two thirds of that was caused by CO2. That's the sort of benefit. It's why we put CO2 into greenhouses. So the whole basis, the whole bedrock of climate alarmism is wrong. Absolutely wrong. And today, look it up. Look it up on World of Data. Look it up on Google. We have record crops in Africa, record crops in the Far East, record rice crops, record all sorts of crops. And that's because of CO2. Right? So more CO2 is good. It also does something else. We have been through a CO2 famine just pre-industrial revolution when the CO2 level was really low. The plants were gasping for it. They couldn't grow properly. We didn't, we had starvation. In that world they want to go back to, we lived really in a peasant community, starving. And what happens when you give a plant more CO2 is it needs less water. So that's why the German scientists did a study on the Sahara Desert and found it decreasing in size, not increasing. All the evidence is there for you. Right. Let me give some examples now. I used to be in charge of Wales planning water resources and things. I built a model in the 1970s which really interested me. It was based on really trying to understand the river flows in a rainfed river system. And in that model I discovered the cell the sun cycle, the 11 year sun cycle. That sparked my interest 50 years ago. Now if I take droughts, we are now getting less extreme weather than in history, than in our short term for over a few hundred years. It's less extreme. The biggest drought in the UK was 1775. Nothing has come near it since. What's the next biggest drought? 1798. This is the world they want to go back to. What's the next biggest drought? 1808, then 1854, 1887, 1890, 1921. I've just read out the top five droughts, the top worst droughts in British history. 
and it's the same for floods. They go on about the Pakistan floods, but look at history. And by the way, Pakistan has reduced its forests so much, it's down by, I think, about 90%. Because when you've got poverty, people chop down wood. People chop down the wood to get the energy. And that causes floods. But the floods in the past were worse. Forest fires, is a good one. You may have heard of a bloke called Biden. He came into power and he didn't like the record on forest fires because it's only 20% in America now what it was in the past. In 1920s and 30s, it was five times higher. And this data was on the public government moral website. So when he came into power, do you know what he did? He deleted the data prior to it. He just deleted the data. You'd have to be a nutter, a nutter, to accept that. They actually hide it. Hurricanes are less. Tornadoes are well down. Well, let's go on about Antarctica. You hear the stories about a high temperature in Antarctica. By the way, it's true. From South America, you can get a little blast of wind, as it were, that brings some hot air to the peninsula. Antarctica is now the coldest it's ever been on record. Check that online. It's the coldest it's ever been. And actually, funny enough, more CO2 cools Antarctica. But, you know, that is a fact. And that was also established by satellite and by terrestrial observation by a group of scientists in the EU. And I quote all these on my website. My website, not my website, but my YouTube channel is, desi is designed to give you videos that link the science that anyone can understand. And one of the best compliments I had was my 11 year old son understood it and said, hey, that's not what I'm taught at school. And the real sin is teaching children at school this absolute rubbish because for the last 30 years there's been a mass brainwashing movement of children right well, let's go on about drowned islands none of them are drowned 90 percent of them have grown eight percent growth overall Tuvali or Tuvalu, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the most prone island in the world, the one they featured, this is going to go first, has grown 2.9%. But it doesn't stop their leaders sitting in a pool of water on the shore saying, help, help us, give us money. That's what the whole of the IPCC is about. It's controlled by third world countries. They even write the scientific report at the end that goes to all the politicians, called the summary for policy makers. I do a video on that. And the coral, coral in the world, the Great Barrier Reef is now the record healthiest it's ever been in history, that we, you know, in recorded history. And coral around the world, 80% of it, is healthier than it's ever been. That's a recent report. Power generation. Now, what they're doing today is signing contracts with wind and solar to bake in high energy costs for you. I'll give you one, I'll give you something now you can check. They'll say this wind farm can do 10,000 houses, or this solar farm can do 5,000 houses. It's not true. And they say they use off-gem off -gem figures. That's true. But the off-gem figure has 2.9 of it, or 20% will say, is electricity, and 80% is gas. So in other words, yeah, they can claim they can do 5,000 houses, providing those houses of 80% of their energy supplied by gas that they're trying to do away with. And this applies, I can promise you, I've got a video on it, this applies to every single claim by every single wind farm and anyone can see through it. And so I went to the developers of one of those here, the solar farm, I went to the developers meeting and I said, how much power do you produce? They couldn't answer me. They couldn't even get the units of power right. Right, that's how bad this is. So. We're now paying, sometimes, wind farms 50% of the time not to turn on. We have to pay them not to give us the power. Why? Because overnight when demand is low and the wind blows, the contract says we've still got to buy it. So we can't buy it. We haven't got a use for it. You have to keep the grid in balance. And so what happens is we have to give it away or we have to pay people to take it. We pay Belgium to take the energy from us. Three, Three wind farms in Scotland were studied by a group of MPs. 50% of the time, they were paid not to give us power. 50%. If Ed Miliband and the next Labour government, if it comes in, has their way, they want to treble the wind farms. 
that's going to mean that most of the time, all the energy from wind farms is, is going to be paid, even though they don't turn on. Because we're going to have so much organized energy we can't store. And I've done a video on this, because no one's doing the maths. I could go into detail. Then, as a cheaper way of getting around this, they're saying, let's pay you not to take the energy between four and six, up to 10 times the price, at 33 pence a kilowatt hour for me now, and they've offered me four pounds. Right? That is cheaper. I'll tell you why. Because when the solar farm gets paid, it doesn't get paid solar farm price or wind farm price. It gets paid, it gets paid the highest price on gas that day. And you know we've gone 50 times the normal price. So everyone gets paid a super high price. It's an absolute con. And these are all being baked in now. The Welsh Government on that solar farm, so I'm now coming to the next point, green. I have been an environmentalist all my life. At the age of 11, I gave pocket money to try and clean up our rivers. I've been involved in that at the highest levels. I was in head office of Wales. I was the 11th employee of the Welsh Water Authority at the time. And I, you know, looked into the droughts. I looked into this. I had to design reservoirs, everything. That was my job. And they don't, they, they don't today um, bother when it's green. When it comes to green, the solar farm in Wales now they're proposing is on a 53 acre site with badgers, with an ancient forest, with 11 species of bats, I didn't even know there were that many. And when I asked the developers where's the environment report, there's none. The Welsh government said, you don't need one. You try and get a house built without a bat survey or something. No chance at all. No chance at all. But you can get the green. If it's green, it trashes the environment very often. But they don't understand that. Wind farms in Germany have study 200,000 bats killed a year. 200,000 bats a year. 3,500 tons of flying insects. Birds. Many, many birds, especially birds of prey. So I could go on forever about all this. But it's on my YouTube, it's on my YouTube channel in detail if anyone wants to follow. Now, I have tried to have debates with leading professors. In fact, you know, Professor uh, who, who's the best-selling book at the time on Amazon, on climate change, only to discover they have no understanding of the data. I was absolutely shattered about the lack of understanding. I have tried to debate Extinction Rebellion. I've had two confrontations with them, nice debates. In the first one, they ended up saying, Paul, you're wrong, when the wind doesn't blow, we use gas. So I had Extinction Rebellion supporting gas. In the second one, they said, oh, we can use a new coal method where we can bring in coal power very quickly. So an extinction rebellion supporting coal. That's how mad this world is. Everyone runs away from debate with me. That's my problem. And now, when you see my YouTube channel, you'll understand why. And the biggest thing for my YouTube channel is to show it to kids. Because it's designed for anyone. It really is. But it backs everything I say up with science and evidence. My dream would be to debate, and if the BBC's here, try this. My dream is to debate Ed Miliband on BBC, because he's likely to be in a Labour government, the one controlling all this madness. That's my dream, and there's a challenge, because they're going to do that. Because the law of the land is, when it comes to climate change, this is the law, this is the law of the land. You cannot, you cannot, you are allowed not to give an even balance of argument when it comes to climate change. You can only present one side. That is a law introduced by Blair into legislation, right? They have decided what the science was 20 years ago. They decided it, and that's not the scientist. And if you argue, like the born professor who pointed out that the coral reef in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, was the healthiest it's ever been, if you do that, you get sacked. There is now a complete industry of tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of scientists, because mortgages depend on this alarmism carrying on. It's not true. And I'm willing to debate anybody, full stop. So bring it on, you know, bring it on. I'll debate them, and I'll debate them in public. Right? Thank you. I just want to say, guys, that we're obviously not fans of the mainstream media, right? No. We've got Panorama, BBC's Panorama just here. Can we give them a big boo? 
we've got ITV. Can we give them a big boo? And we've also got another reporter from the BBC. And we give them a big boo. The biggest boo for the BBC. Thank you very much. I'm just asking the panorama guy. Are you sure you want to come backstage? Thank you. Bullshit Corporation. That's where you are. Anyway, guys, we'll crack on. We've only got uh, three more speakers, very, very brief. And then we're going to get marching to make some noise. And then Panorama can probably come out with a massive hit piece of half an hour. Bullshit on the BBC again. Anyway, our next speaker, our next speaker, you'll know, he's been with us in the freedom movement, as we call it, the United Peaceful Freedom Movement. And since 2010, he went through what he calls his conscious awakening. And a lot of us have been through that. This guy's a DJ. He's been fighting with us, talking with us, and fighting for our civil liberties and human rights now for the last three years. Mark Devlin! There's a reason why certain phrases have entered into common parlance. And one of them, which we'll all be familiar with, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. BBC. Yeah. It's actually the emblem for the Fabian society, denoting the slow creep of Fabian socialism or cultural Marxism into society. The wolf in sheep's clothing also describes what is proposed for Oxford. And today is a very important day. History is watching. Because it's Oxford today, and it's everybody else's town and city tomorrow, if what is proposed here is allowed to succeed. So a wolf in sheep's clothing describes something which appears innocent and harmless on the surface, in how it's presented, but is actually deeply malevolent and harmful when you strip away the service. That describes what's going on here, right? We can see that what is being proposed for Oxford is nothing about worthy, noble causes such as protecting the environment, zero carbon emissions, sustainable development, and all these other appeals to emotion with which it's been presented. These are tactics, psychological weaponry employed by the advertising industry and perfected by Edward Bernays, the master of propaganda and public relations. That's how this is being presented. We know better. We know, as we've heard from many of the speakers, and Jasmine summed it up brilliantly, that this is just a stepping stone towards the new world order nightmare future that the psychopaths have lined up for us. But they're not going to succeed. Right? There's a reason why Oxford has been chosen as the blueprint for all of this. I know a thing or two about this city. I was born here. I grew up in the area. Used to work on Fox FM, for anyone that remembers that, back in the day. DJ'd at the Park End Club. But more recently, I've worked as a private hire driver up until Convid. And I used to have in the back of the car people like big pharma executives, lecturers and professors from the university. And I would hear some of the conversations that went on in the back of the car. Oxford has been selected because it's perceived as a place which is very system-minded, where people listen to establishment sources. But I would suggest that they've made a tactical error with this one, and that they've overreached. And the great turnout we see, see here today is indicative of that. When the reality of what these 15-minute cities really are going to mean for people in their regular daily lives hits home and the penny drops, there is going to be massive resistance to the attempted theft of our rights and freedoms.
in George Orwell's 1984, which seems like a fitting story, the character O'Brien says to Winston Smith, if you want a vision of the future, Winston, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. I say to hell with that vision of the future. I have two potential visions of the future myself. In one, we're all standing around in a Soviet Cold War era gulag in the exercise yard, looking at each other, scratching our heads, saying, how the hell did we end up here? In the other vision of the future, the one which I prefer, at some point, we're all sitting with our grandchildren on our knee, and they're saying to us, Granddad, Grandma, what were you doing in the early 2020s when the psychopaths attempted to take away our future and plunge us into this New World Order nightmare? And we can look him in the eye and we can say, Sweetheart, I was doing everything I could with every fibre of my being to resist it. And you know what? We put it down. Our generation put down this threat. I want to be able to say that, and I believe we all will. We need to say that we saw what was coming, and we said, you want to do what? Not on our watch. Not on our watch. The answer is no. Thank you. I know I've already done it once, but BBC. Shame on you! 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 Alright, look, I, you know, I jest. I think you're alright, you're a cameraman. I'm trying to cover myself now. We are peaceful, but shame on you. No, seriously, guys, we, we know that you, you're laughing, he's laughing, everyone. He's probably, you know that we're telling the truth, and you know that we're on the right side of history, BBC. So, as long as you report the truth, then we're all right with you. Anyway, our next speaker, most of you are going to know as well. This guy, he's pretty much an expert in, in leadership and human potential. This guy has been with us from the very beginning as well. He's been talking to you, he does a podcast, he's been speaking the truth, and he's done an awful lot for the freedom movement, human rights and civil liberties. So please make some noise for Dan Aston Gregory. All right, good afternoon everyone. Great to see so many people here. Now I'm guessing you people at the front I've already made up your mind that this is a really bad idea to introduce these schemes, am I right? Yeah. Great. So I want to speak to the people who have come here out of curiosity today to find out what's going on. Because the reality is, our dear friends at the BBC and others aren't really speaking about this at all. But this is a global rollout of a scheme called the 15 Minute Cities. And when people say that, you know, the press, like the BBC, will say, oh, it's a grand, the, the, the conspiracy theorists are saying it's a grand conspiracy. Well, if you look at it, it's an open conspiracy because you've got organizations like the C40 and the Global Covenant of Mayors who have all signed up to the idea that we do these 15-minute cities. And in the UK, already 100-plus councils have said, yes, we're going to do what Oxford are doing and others before them. And with everything that's been spoken here today, there's always an emotional plea to some utopian ideal. And I can understand it. I can understand the appeal of a, uh, you know, a, a green city with, 
you know, lots of beautiful areas for our children to play in. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't actually want to live in an area where there's lots of great amenities nearby? We all want that kind of thing. So where are the checkbooks at the local councils in terms of investing in beautifying the area, investing in industry, investing in local jobs? You would expect a 15-minute scheme which promises these wonderful ideals of everything you need within 15 minutes of your doorstep to actually be out there actively building and investing in your local community. But how many people know a local or national government that is spending their money wisely at the moment? You know, this is a left-leaning city, I know that. And again, the media will say, oh, the right wing, right wingers came here today. I've, I've been politically homeless all of my life. There's things on the left I like, there's things on the right I like, there's things on the left I'm appalled by, and there's things on the right I'm appalled by. But the, rea the reality, <laughs> no wonder why we're politically homeless in the state of affairs we find ourselves in here today. But the governments are needlessly spending our money on war and, you know, cronyism and all the things that has been billions have been spent through the last three years on COVID, leaving us in quite a precarious situation. So no, we're not facing a beautiful 15-minute city where everything is wonderfully available on your local doorsteps, wonderful education for your children, beautiful parks, wonderful amenities, lovely restaurants. If that was really what was on offer, you would see people's legs matching their mouths and taking action to actually build vibrant communities. And I'm sure we'd all agree with that ideal. That's the promise. But like every con man, it's a miss sale. It will be missold. Because what's not up what's on offer, rather than this beautiful, lovely, vibrant environment on your doorstep, is surveillance, car CCTV, watching your every move, blockade, stopping you moving around the city, and and, and, and completely of removing your ability to travel freely. And the reality is that within every utopian ideal, there has to be realism and practical reality. There has to be pragmatism. You know, if you're a major employer in Oxford, how are your employers going to get to you if you're only able to get within 15 minutes of your city? Now, of course, there's exemptions. Right, okay. All this language we're getting used to for your own safety, exemptions, it's all become normalized in this new normal. Who's, who accepts the new normal, by the way? I think it's time that we define a brighter future for ourselves. It's time for us to take the power back and say, actually, we do want vibrant, beautiful, lovely communities on our doorstep. But who's going to build them? If we wait for the government, we'll be waiting the rest of our lives. It's down to you and I. It's down to each one of us to say, actually, I'm going to take personal responsibility in this decade, and I'm going to make a difference in my community. I'm going to lock arms the people next to me, left and right. I don't care where they lean politically, but I'm going to make a decision to actually make a beautiful community, and we're going to say no to the state powers that are trying to intervene and micromanage every single detail of our lives. Yeah. There's a great paternalism about the government. They think they're your parents. The reality is that we're adults. We don't need other parents. We don't need more parents. And the hard thing is this. I grew up, I'm 39 years old. I turned 40 this year. I grew up in the days of analog television. Who can remember analog television? <laughs> and then it started to get a little bit digital, digital when I was a child. And there was this parental control setting which would prevent you as a child from seeing things that are unacceptable to see. Now, my parents never switched that on because they simply taught me. They taught me a lesson about what's acceptable for a young child to consume. They taught me to understand principles and values, and therefore they enabled me to make my own decisions. They could have just switched it off so I couldn't ever learn for myself, and that's the kind of world that we're living in right now, is that people want to shut you down and take control. What kind of lesson are we sending to our children if that's the way we live? Why don't we empower people and nurture people to actually make a difference in our community rather than shutting us down and stopping our movement and preventing us from living our lives? And I agree with everything that's been said here today. Thank you. We must stop it at its roots. This is a cause set in motion. It's already happening. 
and the resistance is building, but they're acting fast and they've got a lot more money and power than we have. But we've got people power. We've got people power. And when we come out in numbers and we have the courage to share the stories with one another and speak our true voice, because you know what, we've been suppressed for so long, we're slammed the media. The minute, the minute we say anything that goes against the narrative, you're slammed. It's time to have the courage to go beyond that. Regardless of what the media say about what happened here today, we know what happened here today. We were here, we're living it, we're breathing it, and we're not afraid to challenge authority. But we are willing to challenge authority on the basis that we do want a brighter future. We do want that nice ideal. But we know that it's only going to happen if we take matters into our own hands. And that's why we're here today. Thank you very much.